Greetings, everyone. I'm going to talk a bit about assembly language fundamentals uh, in chapter three. This is really where we get into the nuts and bolts of what the course is about. And I consider chapter three to be more like reference material, like a dictionary, something that, yes, you're going to read through or peruse through, but you're going to need to come back to it um, throughout the course to remember, you know, how different variables are typed and defined. So we'll go over it, but be sure to come back and to use it as reference material. We'll be on chapter three for a couple weeks. Uh, so you'll have review questions and your first programming problems really starting this, this week. First, I wanna talk about integers. Uh, when we define an integer, it has kind of three parts. First, there's the uh, there's an optional plus or minus symbol. Um, there then there's the actual symbols that define the number itself, and then the suffix is called a radix, and it essentially tells us what type of integer it is. There's four real options. We have hexadecimal, which is H decimal, which is a base ten which is D, hexadecimal course is base 16, binary is base two, that's B, and then we have encoded real. So some examples here, 30 D is the number 30, that's a decimal, 6 A H is a hexadecimal integer, 42, since it has no radix, is actually a decimal. So a decimal is assumed if the radix isn't specified. And then finally, 1101B would obviously be binary. If the hexadecimal number begins with a letter, we have to preface it with a zero. Otherwise, uh, it will actually throw an error when the code is run. Uh, the assembler actually, if it's a zero, interprets the zero as an identifier instead of the number itself. If you've taken, you know, any algebra, you're going to be familiar with this, but um, when we're dealing with mathematical expressions, we have this concept of operators, and each of those operators are done in a certain order by the assembler. So parentheses is really where we explicitly define a grouping of numbers. That's given a precedence level first, meaning that the the uh, the CPU accomplishes that one first. Then we have our unary plus or minus, which is essentially like multiplication. It's taking the number and either multiplying it times negative one or positive one. Then we do our multiply and divide. Then the mod, which is essentially our remainder after the division. And then finally, add and subtract are last. So if you've done algebra, you're probably familiar with this, but these are very specific operators and their precedence levels. And we see a few examples here. We have 16 divided by 5. Uh, that's actually a value of 3. For the divide, there's actually a remainder of 1 but the division is going to give us just the integer result. Um, well, you can see in the next one we have a multiplication and parentheses. So the parentheses are done first, so we're going to end up with 3 plus 4. That's going to be 7, a negative 7, and it's going to be multiplied times positive 5, which is going to give us negative 35. So the order matters there in terms of accomplishing the parentheses first. If we do the same operation without the parentheses, we are going to multiply the 4 and the 6 first, giving us 24, and then subtract 4 from that to give us 20. So mat order matters. Next, we've got character literals. So anything that's enclosed in either single or double quotes is considered a character literal. Strings, which are multiple characters, would be same thing, enclosed in single and double quotes. 
Each character is a single byte, which is essentially eight bits. Uh, so, for example, you may have read it, but the um, the character uh, is essentially going to be an ASCII character is going to have a number between an integer between zero and two fifty five that it's stored as, and so and the, there's a mapping that you actually see at the end of your book that shows the map that shows the mapping between those numbers zero to two fifty five and the different characters. Uh, so, for example, the capital capital A is internally stored as the number 65. When we're talking about commands and things that are used in our program, there are certain words that we can't use as variable names. Um, we can't use instruction mnemonics like moving. Move, we haven't gone over that too much yet, but moving, adding, multiplying, these are things that perform actions in our assembly code. Those cannot be given as names for variables. Register names like EAX, EBX, which we've talked about, directives, attributes, operators, and predefined symbols, um, which are used, cannot be variable names. Identifier is a, it's a programmer chosen name. Uh, it might identify variables, procedures, constants, um, and there's a, some specific rules for those. There, it's not case sensitive. Some languages are, assembly languages not. Um, the first character has to be a letter so that the assembler will identify it correctly. And obviously it can't have a reserved word. So next we're gonna talk about directives. Directives are commands that are in the source code, but they are not executed at runtime. That's an instruction. A directive helps to define the variables, the macros, the procedures. It helps to define and give order to the structure of the code so that at runtime, the correct code is executed. A couple of examples of directives are uh, defining a type, like a D word for a variable. Also, we referenced this earlier, but defining segments. Segments are area of our assembler code that essentially create categories uh, within the code. We have the data section, uh, which essentially tells us where we, uh, it, it's where we define our variables. We have the code section which is obviously where we execute the code. We have stack and a few others. Next, we have the instructions area. This is where we actually have statements. Uh, an instruction is a statement that actually executes. So a mnemonic, which we haven't talked about yet, but a move or an, an add or multiply, those are going to be instructions. Um, Operands, operands, uh, you know, the thing that act, operators that actually behave on something like a plus sign would also be an example of an instruction. Next, we have labels. They essentially serve as place markers in the code. In higher level languages, we don't really use these too much. If you've used C sharp or uh, there is the concept to use a hashtag and it's a place in the code that can be referenced. Uh, and in the code itself. But in assembly, a label is, if it's in the area of instruction, it is always gonna end with a, a colon. And one use of it, for example, would be if we're in a code loop and you see at the bottom there, L1 colon, that is a label of a specific area of code. And if the loop references the L1 label, it can jump using the JMP mnemonic to that label. Next we have mnemonics and operands. Mnemonic generally is a like an acronym. It's 
it's a short name that's supposed to be clue you into what it does, be easy to remember. So some of the mnemonics, the instruction mnemonics that we will use frequently in this class, we have move, which is essentially moving or assigning a value to another value, add, which is adding, sub, which is subtracting, mole, which is multiplying, jump, we just talked about, moves you in the code, sometimes in low-level languages is used uh, in the case of loops. And then we have operands. An operand is essentially an input or an output. So if we have, we used this the other day, but we have, uh, if we're adding two numbers together, two plus four, uh, the operands are going to be two and four, and the output operand is going to be the result, six. So we would actually have three in that particular case. Comments. If you've done any kind of coding, you know comments are important to describe the purpose of the program, when it was written, why it was written, who wrote it, when was it last modified, etc., etc. In assembly, we have comments and they begin with a semicolon. There's also the concept of block comments, uh, and that's actually misspelled here, but it's C O M M E N T. When we have that keyword, uh, that, as we talked about earlier, reserved word, then the code knows that that's a comment. So you have comment and then a symbol, and I guess you can choose whatever symbol you want. You can, uh, a couple of examples that I've seen are ampersand or exclamation point, but as long as it's a consistent symbol, you start with that, you have the comment keyword, you have a start symbol like exclamation point, then you have your comment block, and then you have your end symbol. And that tells the code that the comment is essentially over. Okay. And just here's a few examples. Um, we have some operands here. It, at the bottom one, we are adding EBX and ECX. Those are both two, two registers as operands. We have um, a variable and a constant. So these are just a couple different examples for inputs and outputs for our assembly code. And then I wanted to finish this section by just looking at the add to example, which the, the author of the book, he begins to go over uh, in section 3.2. It's kind of our first look at assembly code. And uh, you will do, in your first week, you will spend some time with this familiarizing yourself. So you can see we've got a couple of the concepts we've talked about up till now. We have some mnemonics. We have the move. We are moving a value of five to the EAX register. And then we are adding to the EAX register six. So we have two mnemonics there. Um, we also have the EAX and 5 and EAX and 6 are operands. You can see we've got some comments up at the top that start with semicolons. We also have here some uh, directives. We have the dot .code directive, which you can see about halfway down, that gives us an indication that this is the area where we're writing our code. We have the dot .stack directive. We have the... Uh, a few other directives, which we'll talk about later, that give us some information about the kind of assembly program this is. In this case, it's a 30, some of these dire uh, directives specify that we're working in 32-bit instead of 64-bit.